We used to sing this song when we would have fellowship, and many of you will probably know it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. How many know that song? A lot. We used to sing that over and over and over again. Nice song, nice song. Uh, for some reason, I was thinking about last week even, uh, still Easter Sunday. I hadn't even preached here yet, but I was traveling back from Good News, coming here, getting ready to speak, and I just began to think about um, spiritual fathers and, and what that means. And so throughout this week, I was thinking about it and kind of developed some thoughts on it. As I started working on the idea of the family of God, it kind of grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Not that my sermon's going to be longer and longer, but I had to narrow down a lot of the thoughts that were coming uh, as it related to the family of God. In, first, or in John, the Gospel of John 1, 12, and 13 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name. So if you have received and believed in him, uh, he gave the right to become the children of God. There's a family relationship between God Almighty, the creator of the, and the, of the universe, and us that have believed in his name and have been saved. There's a family relationship. We're the children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision. That means we weren't born necessarily as uh, Jews, but as Gentiles. We weren't born of natural descent. It wasn't a human decision. It wasn't a father and a mother or a husband's will, but born of God. See, when we were born again in salvation, we were then brought into the family of God. And so we all have the privilege of being part of the family of God. And I think one of the great things about the local church is that we are a family. We come from different places and different backgrounds. We all have different parents for the most part, but yet we still have the same Heavenly Father. We've been saved the same through Jesus Christ. And for, for some reason in his divine wisdom, he has brought us all together right here at Malaga Assembly of God to be the family of God and to be part of each other's lives. Years ago as well, we used to call each other what? Brother and sister, okay? And that adds 30 years to the person's life. If you call them brother so-and-so now, that adds 30 years to their life, sister so-and-so, or as my pastor who couldn't always remember everyone's names, it was always brother and sister. So nice to see you in church today, brother, uh, and I f am falling into that category myself. But it was, it was significant in that it showed that we were related. It was also a sign of respect. Usually it was for more seasoned saints. We called them brother and sister. We actually called our pastor brother Louie out of respect. I call um, uh, Brother Coletti, our district superintendent, I call him Brother Coletti. Now, he has a position of authority over me, and yet we're brothers in the Lord. And I look to him as a, in a spiritual sense as an older brother, you know, with wisdom. We're, we're, we're not inferior to each other in any way. We're related through Jesus Christ, but we call each other brother brother and sister. Why? Because we're part of God's family. Romans 8, 13 and 17 says, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. See, our desires are different now that we're part of the family of God. We want to live to uh, according to our name and live up to the name of Jesus our, uh, and God our Father. We are the sons of God, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And Abba is a closer relationship to God. It's more than just... Uh, father, it's, it's a dad relationship, uh, Abba. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now think of it. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of the universe, as we read at the beginning. All things were created by him and for him, and yet he wants us to be part of his family. Isn't that awesome? He loves us so much. Now, we, in salvation, we are adopted into his family. 
because we were born sinners and chose to sin. And so we were outside of his family because of sin. But then when we repent and believe, he welcomes us in to his family. We're no longer outsiders looking in through the window wishing we could be part of that family. We're part of God's family. What a great privilege that that is. But here's the verses I want to, um, almost, almost, wait. Some other verses, let me get to these. I'm trying to lay the background before I get to the main point. 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. See how much he loves us, he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. John was writing to the church, and he was telling them, you're a part of the family of God. To be a Christian is to be part of the church. We would call it the universal church or the invisible church. And the church, the universal invisible church, is made up of billions of people. But for us, we're privileged to be part of a local church, Malaga Assembly of God. We would call that the visible church. We have brothers and sisters all around the world, and that's awesome. And when we get to heaven, we'll meet them. But here in our church, we have brothers and sisters in the Lord, and that is also a wonderful and great thing. We, uh, John writes to, uh, in 1 John that he calls them his, children, his dear children. And this is the relationship I want to focus on today. And this is our, our passage in 1 John 2, 12 through 14. 1 John 2, 12 through 14. Now watch this. I wrote to you, and what's the next word? Dear children. So John is what relationship to the people of that church? A what? A spiritual father. Do you see that? They're like his spiritual children. And he loves them dearly. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Not all people are God's children. Now, now think about this. Some would say we're all God's children. In the sense that God created all of us, that's true. But those that have rejected Jesus and God's divine plan are not part of the family of God. And that doesn't make us superior, that should break our hearts because God wants his family to grow. Now think of it when, when uh, for some of you, uh, well, I'll get, to the, I'll get to that in a second, when you found out that you were having a, a child and how exciting it was and, and somewhat terrifying, but very exciting for sure. We always had the joke, back in the day, the joke was you get a, oh, I hate to even say this, we, we would say you get a VCR. Do you remember what VCRs are? And they give you a manual this thick. They give you a baby and send you home. And, you know, with nothing. But um, how exciting it is to have children. And then the next stage of life, you watch the children grow. And then they get married. And then they have children. And from what I hear, having grandchildren is even better. Even better than having children. And why is it better to have grandchildren and children? Go ahead. I don't know. Help me. Because you can send them home, one, one grandmother says. Good. What else? That is your reward for not killing your own children. Grandchildren, yes, are the reward for not killing your own children. Very good. Very good. Grandchildren, someday. I look forward to that. Not today. Someday. <laughs> we look forward to that. But how exciting it is. Now, look how the church is described. What happens when someone comes and becomes a new believer? They're a new child in the family. That's why it's so exciting for everyone. For us that have been in the church for a, a, a while, 
and I include myself in that now as I looked at the gentleman that took the offering, all of them I remember as little, little children. Now here they are serving the Lord and coming to church regularly and faithfully and wanting to serve the Lord with their whole lives. Isn't that awesome? That's exciting for us. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that that happens. And I think it's an important thing that has to happen. And this is what John is writing about. There's a chart. Let's go to this chart uh, that I found, and we'll walk you through this. And then I'll make some application. He's writing to the little children among you, that is the newborn Christian, because your sins are forgiven. That's the first step in our spiritual walk. If our sins aren't forgiven, then we are not um, in, in the family of God. But if our sins are forgiven, no matter where we come from before that, we are then part of the family of God. The second one is to spiritual fathers among you. That is the spiritually mature with a deep and rich knowledge of God because you have known God and have been faithful from the beginning. So there's a different category. Again, it's not superiority, but it's a different level of uh, relationship to God. And to the young men among you, that is the mature believers because you have overcome the wicked one. So in this, we see that there are new believers, those whose sins have been forgiven. There are spiritual fathers who are mature, deep, and rich in knowledge. There are young men who are strong in the word. Now let me say this while I'm thinking of it. This doesn't exclude women at all. Women were always part of the New Testament church. They were the first evangelists and so on and so forth, so don't get that. I'm just using the words that John uses. We need spiritual fathers. We also need spiritual mothers. You see that? And so we're not excluding in that. I'm just using the wording that he's using. We need spiritual fathers that are mature, deep, and rich in knowledge. And spiritual fathers is not necessarily based on age because someone could be older and really not be a spiritual father or not mature in their faith at all. Where someone could be somewhat younger and still be very mature in their, in their faith. But yet, there has to be a time period. What is the time period? I don't know. But it's probably better not to take someone that was just saved, put them in a position of spiritual father, and then unfortunately watch them fall away because they're unable to handle that responsibility. Here's how it plays out in media. Someone famous will get saved. They do their Christian circuit route. And then a couple years later you hear they fell away from the Lord. Why? Well, because they weren't ready yet. They weren't ready. Paul says in leadership, choose mature people. People that have uh, had some time. Uh, some time in their, in their walk with the Lord. And we need young men that are strong in the word, strong to fight the evil one. We need new believers, men and women. We need spiritual fathers and mothers. We need uh, strong young men and young women to carry out uh, the ministries and the work of the Lord. I don't usually uh, go downstairs on Sunday mornings because by the time I get done here, they're, they're done. But I have gone down on Wednesdays for our, our ministries, our boys' ministries, our, our girls' ministries. And I watch the teachers and I see what they're doing with these children. I'm so thankful for them. And I also recognize that's not the calling that God has given me. I'm not real good with, with children. That's, that's not, that's not my, my thing. Uh, when I have grandchildren, it's going to be different, I'm sure. That's what I keep hearing. I'm just going to spoil them. My kids aren't around to hear this, but I'm just going to spoil them rotten. Let, let them deal with the consequences. I've paid my dues. How about it, dear? Right? We'll just spoil them rotten uh, and send them home. Send them home. And um, we're just praying that they live close. Uh, that's what we're praying, but we want God's will. I understand my mother now better than ever, uh, how hard it is uh, for her. But we tell our kids, we, you know, when Lindsay comes home, I know this is going to be on video, it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, you help your kids financially and money for gas and all of this stuff. And uh, uh, Lindsay's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, thank you so much. And she's very, and Joseph is too, very appreciative. And here's our new song 
that's all right, that's okay, we're going to live with you someday. <laughs> that's all right, that's okay, we're going to live with you someday. So, yeah, but anyway, <laughs> we need that. We need it in the church, too. That's all. That's all. Uh, that's really uh, the main thrust. It's kind of a weird message. You know, yesterday, or last week's such a big week. This, this week, I don't know why the Lord gave me this, but I, I felt there was a reason for it. I'm just kind of talking and sharing, and we're, we're interacting here today as, as a family. Uh, the goal of the family, the church, is this. We must mature children who have experienced salvation. We must help them to grow spiritually. To young men who know the word of God and can wage the spiritual battle. We need to help them and be there for them. To fathers who have walked intimately with God over a significant period of time and have been used to reproduce the next generation of spiritual fathers. If men are not reproducing spiritually, they have stopped short of experiencing and practicing full spiritual maturity. We can be in church a long time and we can know the word of God very well, but there's something about pouring our lives into the next generation. Now, that might not necessarily be going down on Sunday morning and teaching the children, but it might be when one of our children wants to go to camp and there's some financial concerns that the spiritual men and women are the first ones to say, you know what, it's so important that they go to camp to hear the word of God that I'm going to help them. That's also, it's not just teaching them, it's interacting with them. And I have nothing but good to say about our church. Anything our kids and youth need, the church, you know, gives overwhelmingly. It's not to make a, a point other than just keep doing that. Again, you don't have to teach them personally to impact the next generation that's coming up. You're doing that. You're doing that. Your faithfulness is doing that already. But our goal as a church is to make disciples, and we would relate that to a family, is by making mature family members, mature family members. And again, not based on age. We all have family members that aren't mature make horrendous decisions and affect the rest of the family, right? That happens in churches as well. Age does not mean maturity. I'm the youngest of our family, and there was a Facebook meme where these, I think it was dogs were jumping through a fence, like out in the farm somewhere, and the last dog gets his head caught, and he's going like this. And the, the phrasing was, there's always one of the siblings, you know, the one that gets stuck and everything. So I wrote to my brothers and said, I think I'm that sibling. I think I'm the one that keeps getting, getting stuck in that. But we need each other. We need to mature and to grow. W what was an example or who was an example besides John, because I already told you that, that was a spiritual father in the Bible? Okay, Abraham was a spiritual father. Paul, Paul in the New Testament. And who was one of his spiritual sons? Timothy. Paul, in a natural sense, didn't have Timothy as a son, but in a spiritual sense, he very much did. Now, the last letter that he ever wrote was written, before he died, was written to who? Timothy. Okay? Uh, Timothy. Because he had such a strong spiritual connection to Timothy, he wrote to him last because he wanted him to carry on the work that had started. You see, Timothy got saved, new believer. Young man knew the word, the spirit of God was upon him, and yet he needed a spiritual father to help guide him to reach his potential so that when the spiritual father was no longer able to do it, Timothy was able to move into that so that Timothy became a spiritual father to others. This reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. This is what the, we need to be doing and the church needs to be doing. And very simply, I'll just close with these last three points. How do we become a spiritual father or mother? Again, I'm using the words of John but not excluding uh, anyone. How do we become a spiritual father or mother? First of all, spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. How do we know how spiritually mature we are? Does anybody have an answer to that? 
I have one, and when I give it to you, it'll make sense. How spiritually mature we are, how do we gauge that? Okay, by our fruits, but what? Our character, yep, that's part of it. Lind, uh, someone taught me, I said Linda, I said her name. I won't say her last name on tape. Linda taught me, kindness is not a character trait. No, 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 niceness. Being nice is not a character trait. Because someone will be nice to you, and they'll steal everything you've got. That's not a character trait. Nice, isn't it? Do you remember you saying that? No, you did. And I'll always remember you for that. You're like a spiritual great-grandmother to me. More than dessert. Yeah, that's right. No, a lot, a lot. But yeah, nice isn't a character trait. Maturity character. Here's love for God and love for others. How much do they love God according to their fruits? And how much do they love others according to their fruits? The fruit of the Spirit, how much of it relates to others? Love, joy, kindness, peace, patience, right? All of these things, self-control. This, this is it. How do we gauge our maturity based on the fruit of the Spirit, not just based on age? How well, how much do we love God and how well do we get along with others? If you can't get along with other people, there's something, something lacking there because God said, love me and love others. If you say that you love me and yet hate your brother, you really don't love me. So maturity is that. How well do we uh, uh, know the Lord, love the Lord, and love others? That's what it's all about. A father loves all of his children, all of them. They might need love in different ways, but a father loves all of his children. And a spiritual father loves all people. They might love them in a different way. We might get aggravated here and there, but the love never stops. So how well do we get along with God? How well do we get along with other people? That's the designation for spiritual maturity. Known, has known God for a longer period of time, and I've mentioned that. It's not just saved one day, spiritual father the next. Saved one day, memorized the whole book of Galatians the next day, still not a spiritual father. There's got to be time. There has to be testing. Testing. I look to people in my own life that have been through it, been through something. I can trust them. I can trust those that have suffered because they've made it through the other side and they still love God and they're still serving. I don't put a lot of hope or trust in those that haven't experienced pain yet because you're never going to be mature until you've experienced pain. But when you've experienced that pain and suffering that goes along with being a human and you've made it through and you still love Jesus and still love other people, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. He even wants to use that pain that you've been through to be a blessing, to be a spiritual father or a spiritual mother to someone else. So a long period of time of being faithful to the word, to the church, and to their family Faithful to the word of God, reading scriptures, studying the scriptures deeper. We have so many tools available to us now, an unlimited number of tools for those that want to study God's word. Faithful to the church in attendance and ministry and giving, all of those things will equip us and qualify us as a spiritual father and to the family. Because I've always lived in ministry. My whole adult life has been in ministry before I was married, before I had children. But I've always had this thought, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his family? And what does it profit us to be in church all of the time and yet lose our family? See, we have to prioritize and keep priorities in, in order. This church has helped us and has helped me be a better father. Because you've always allowed me and encouraged me to be a part of my children's lives. And for Joseph, a lot of times it was sports. For Lindsay, it was theater and, and different things. But I rarely, rarely missed an event. And it was because of, of all of you. I remember, remember coming to church one uh, Wednesday night when Lindsay was in a championship basketball game. And uh, I'll, I'll call him out because I tease him enough. I want to say something really nice about him. Uh, Richie, 
saw that I was there, and Richie said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I've got responsibilities. And he said, in essence, your responsibility is your daughter. Go, we'll take care of things. You get to her game. That's a spiritual father. That's a spiritual father. And, uh, you know, my kids remember all that, and they love this church. My children love this church. Unfortunately, previous generations of pastors, their children grew up not loving church. And I don't mean this church. I just mean church because it just, I don't know, it just wasn't working. Uh, I'll never forget the day I was picking Lindsay up or she might have been driving me at that point. I don't know. It wasn't too long ago. And she said, I just love our church out of the clear blue. I just love our church. And that just made me feel good as a dad first and as a pastor second, you know. And I'm so thankful for our young people, and many of them are here and others that aren't. A lot of them are involved in children's ministries. You don't see them because they're down, downstairs helping, uh, that are just so willing to help. I, to me, I mean, what, what's better than that? What's better than that? All right, to the church and to your family, to your family. And lastly, uh, a willingness to invest in others. You can't be a spiritual father if you're not willing to invest in others. That investment takes time and wisdom, wisdom, a willingness to share it, encouragement, understanding, and sometimes a kick in the rear end. For guys, anyhow. Guys sometimes need a kick in the rear end. I don't recommend that for, uh, you know, uh, girls. It's different. But sometimes a guy just needs to be talked to man to man, not yelled at and screamed at and ridiculed and run down. But, you know, you're better than this is my kind of thought. You're, you can do this. What? Sometimes it's just this. And, again, I wouldn't say this to everybody, but sometimes you've got to say, you've got to stop your, your, your whining and just get out there and do something. That's a spiritual kick in the rear end. I've needed it. And I'll need another one, I'm sure. And I'm thankful, thankful for that. But you can't just kick them all the time. There has to be an encouragement. There has to be time. All right, let's break it down. And I'm going to close. We're going to go to communion. Look, we're a family. For better or worse, God has called us all together. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all together. But he's called us here to be part of Malaga Assembly of God. And we're family here. And we love each other. And we help each other. We care for one another. We have some that are new to the faith that we need to help them to mature. We have some that are young and strong in their faith, but maybe a lot of zeal and lacking wisdom. We have others that are spiritual fathers. And we need all three, and spiritual mothers. We need all three to be a functioning and viable and church that's going to last beyond our generation and into the next generation. What does God want you to do? What is he calling you to do? To be a part of someone else's life, to help them grow in their walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Simple, simple message today. Thanks for coming out after Easter.